All right. Uh, very warm welcome back, everybody of you, to the Predictive Analytics World uh, Climate. Um, here we are in this uh, next expert round talking about data acquisition. Uh, as we learned uh, in the rounds before, that data for any sorts of modeling and also climate-related analytics is key. We're looking very much forward to these um, presentations today. And we well are starting now with uh, Sharavani um, Basu. So you are uh, Managing Director of the SBSF, the Science Business Sustainable Futures um, a consultancy. Um, we will uh, have uh, two talks from your organization and I would just say the floor is yours. Looking forward to your contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, just to set things straight, we are, a, we used to be a consultancy but now we have moved on to become um, a company that is uh, developing products. And we will discuss about some of the products that we have developed at SPS of Agritech during the course of this presentation. So thank you again for giving us this opportunity to share with you what we do at SPS of Agritech. Um, today, I'll be co-presenting with uh, Dr. Sebastian Foucault, who is an advisor to our board. So um, just to give you a brief introduction on the topic that yes, data can feed the world, but do we have the right data? Agriculture, as you know, is one of the most ancient um, profession, and there is a wealth of data that is available in this field. And as time goes by, we are adding more and more data to agriculture, whether it's um, you know satellite images, ra the radar data, or IoT sensor data, etc. And so we have a lot of data that is um, there in this field today. But the question is, is it enough? to um, use in a right way to kind of feed the world um, and do agriculture that is sustainable, that doesn't degrade the environment. And, um, you know, this is the topic we will dwell on as we move forward. So um, just to give you a brief background of SPS of Agritech, um, we are a Yugi and um, uh, we uh, founded SPS of Agritech, which stands for Science, Business and Sustainable Future in uh, August 2000. 20. So um, what we, our goal is to bring, I mean, I'm sure you've all heard about precision agriculture. Now, uh, our goal is to bring precision agriculture to smallholder farmers and smallholder farmers, what I mean by that are these farmers who have less than one hectare of land. And these are the farmers who comprise the bulk of the farming community across the world. Um, so can we bring precision agriculture to these small for farmers who have fragmented land holdings that are difficult to mechanize um, and who are extremely reliant on um, one or two major crops depending on the availability of water or uh, through rainfall or through irrigation. And they use extensively a lot of chemical inputs um, to boost the yield from crops. And as a result, this has led to um, soil degradation. And in some cases, it is so extreme that there is no going back. Also, the shifting climatic patterns, as you all know, um, has resulted in floods and droughts across the world. There's also extreme uh, temperatures or extreme cold that has resulted in huge crop losses. And along with all this also comes um, the emerging and transboundary pests and diseases. What I mean by this is, if you look at the fall army warm in maize, and which affects maize and 80 other crop species, it's a devastating pest that, that eats up the whole field. In um, you know, a couple of weeks, the whole, a week, the whole field could be gone. And so are locusts. So um, these are the things that we have, are the emerging challenges that we have to tackle with. And just a short note on the founding team. So I have two other co-founders, uh, Angel, who is a data scientist. Um, he is based between uh, Spain and uh, Germany and uh, Manan, who is a data scientist as well, based in um, uh, in Delhi. So we are the three founders of SPS Agritech. So, uh, as a representative of the of the data community here as well, um, the question here is really that we all believe that data is key for the future of agriculture. There's, there's no there's no way around it. As Shravani just mentioned, it's been used extensively already. It's used in lots of products. But for SBSF Agritech, we, we were focusing more on sustainability, but also, as mentioned, on more uh, small uh, holding farmers. 
So we come up with one of the first products that I would like to, uh, to develop a little bit with you today that we call the Crop Locator. So essentially what this product is doing is a, it's a, there's a machine learning based model that I will describe a bit in a minute that is uh, helping uh, identifying <coughs> lands that are uh, suitable for developing the same crops. So the, the, the basic concept is around agroecological zones, which are basically areas that present very similar patterns in terms of, of climate and weather, soil, geography, altitude, etc. So the way the model is working is that first we are basically de de uh, de 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 defining those agroecological uh, uh, zones or AAZs um, with uh, uh, using climate and land data together. So the model then can generate uh, the map that you see on, on the right hand side with 160 uh, AAZs identified there. And then what we can do is that cross match these locations that are similar with existing crops that are already uh, naturally growing in those areas. So that will help us then to uh, basically land scout for uh, ideal crop growing regions. So instead of terraforming or providing inputs, you can identify basically your crops that naturally will grow in that place without uh, too much inputs and additions in terms of water or of, uh, of pesticides and chemicals. Uh, you can also start thinking introducing crops that were naturally not growing there, but were uh, actually growing in very similar areas somewhere else in the world. So that's the first part. The crop locator will be used also in the future when you add uh, uh, information of crop statistics, land utilization type, cultural practice, to also go to something that's quite complicated, is pretty yield. So what is under the hood here? Uh, so we have, of, of course, the uh, data. So Crop Locator is using uh, a large bulk of, of uh, valuable, publicly available data, some uh, around uh, climate data, like the RF5 Copernicus data, uh, data on the soil, harmonized world soil data, uh, landscape data, so elevation, uh, slopes, etc., and uh, also very importantly uh, for the crops identification, we're using the GPIF, which is Global Biodiversity Information Facility, which is a, a global crop catalog that is developed by many different institutions globally together. Um, those data is combined to, uh, as a grid of 99 uh, kilometers. And then we extract it from uh, all those climate and soil data around 80 features which are reduced uh, using uh, uh, SVDs to, uh, to 24 features that we can put directly into the model. The core of the crop locator model is purely based on clustering techniques, so or K-means or birch. We have a combination of both. And, and we also bootstrap to ensure stability. That means that we are basically changing slightly the inputs to make sure that we, we can really uh, have a stable model at the end. That's a well-known feature of clustering sometimes that can be uh, unstable and, and, and basically every time you run it, you have slightly different uh, uh, results. Um, the lowest optimized number of clusters for the data set that we have is 160, so hence 160 AZs. And then we can uh, use KD3 uh, techniques to match the, the different catalogs together. As an output, we will have a map that you saw here, but also we can identify uh, uh, potential crops and uh, different sites. So we can do the other way around where these particular crops can grow. Okay, so just to take you into a use case, um, we were contacted by the government of Sikkim. Sikkim is a north uh, is a state in the northeast of India, and it's a, it is in the Himalayas, um, surrounded by Tibet, uh, Nepal, Bhutan. So um, it's um, and the the land that we were asked to redevelop is a 10 hectare plot of land which used to be a seed potato farm lies at an altitude of about 3000 meters um and these are the coordinates of this um, the latitude and longitude as you can see is already there on the slide so um for this plot of land which was lying barren we use the crop locator model to identify um suitable crops that could be growing there so we found around uh, 500 potential plant species that could grow in uh, Sikkim, uh, in this hilly region of Sikkim, um, out of which 80 were cultivable crops. And not surprising, um, we found a lot of uh, crops that were already existing in Sikkim, like Olium, Olium is onion, garlic family, then the Brassicaceae family, the Camellia, Camellia sinensis, it's tea, Physiolus, uh, Vulgaris, all the beans, and Solanum, Solanum is uh, basically potato, aubergines, uh, tomato, these all come from the Solanaceae family. And this used to be a seed potato farm, so um, it proves that the model picked up the right uh, species. But also surprising enough, we also found uh, new species that could be grown in this region, which 
where asparagus theobroma cacao uh, cacao is native to peru hypericum perforatum hypericum perforatum it's a essential oil and it's highly valued medicinal oil um then stevia stevia is basically um natural sweetener and it's a sugar substitute uh, it's native to brazil and paraguay these could be also grown in uh, the hilly region of sikkim um, so in the beginning, we picked uh, cacao. We proposed to grow cacao in um, in this region, uh, but with Corona, that slightly changed because people became more interested in medicinal crops. Uh, given that um, you know, as a side effect of Corona, a lot of people were suffering from uh, secondary pain and um, um, joint pains and stuff like that after recovering from Corona, and there was a huge demand for arnica uh, massage oil in India, and unfortunately. Uh, it was um, there was a supply and demand gap and it's running out of shelves so they asked uh, if we could uh, send some from uh, Europe um, because you know Germany is the largest uh, consumer of Arnica um, and so we started looking into Arnica and we couldn't find any reference of Arnica Montana which is endemic to Europe I mean uh, the center of origin is Europe and we couldn't find any in the GBIF catalog so then I started um, looking into literature and trying to find where is Arnica grown naturally um, and uh, what are the geo-coordinates of these, um, uh, where Arnica can be found. And this is where, um, on, on the left-hand side, you see that the existing production sites of Arnica Montana, it's centered, all centered around Europe, especially um, from, you know, Norway to the Balkans, to Spain, Ukraine, and especially in Romania, around the Carpathian Mountains in Poland. Um, so Arnica, uh, and then we, once we had the data points, um, we ran the crop locator and on the right hand side you can see the output and this shows the potential locations where Arnica can be grown across the world. So as a, as a further validation what I also did is I looked at other species that grows alongside Arnica in its natural and um, semi-natural habitats and some of the species were rhododendron, festuca, festuca rubra. This, uh, this is also a species that grows in Sikkim and surprisingly rhododendron um, uh, this um, the Basse, the Hille region, uh, is home to the largest rhododendron sanctuary in the world. So this shows kind of that uh, Arnica can suitably grow also in Sikkim, which is completely new and um, something that no one would have ever conceived. But if we can prove that it grows, then this is um, you know introducing a new crop into a completely new region of the world. Okay, so as we want to leave enough time for the other participants, obviously, just to wrap it up, uh, and we need to come up with a, a concerting data strategy around agriculture, uh, and in particular on that acquisition. Uh, essentially, as was just mentioned, there are definitely gaps in existing uh, catalogs that, that are easy to fill up. And <clears throat> because uh, if you want to achieve the shift of focus from, you know, major crops, uh, financing and insurance to, uh, as we said, sustainability, uh, 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 resilience to climate change and small holders, you will have to be able to uh, uh, basically uh, acquire the right data. And today, there are several uh, uh, ways to explore that through uh, citizen data acquisitions, IoT, or scraping the literature. And of course, uh, the quality control needs to be achieved. Uh, one last word on the crop diversification. We're also collaborating with Crops for Future, which is a, a company that is reintroducing underutilized and forgotten crops. So crops that were growing naturally in some sites that aren't used today anymore. And then this, I will pass on to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Now, thank you both of you for the interesting and very relevant talk. That's uh, an amazing thing of what uh, you can do when you combine openly and uh, proprietary data sets and uh, uh, create nice solutions out of that. So thank you very much. We, as in all expert rounds, we have questions at the end. Uh, now I'd like to introduce you to the next speaker, who is Christian Schneider. Uh, uh, you are working at uh, weather.com. That should be uh, familiar to many um, of the audience uh, as a weather forecast uh, and much more service-oriented company. You did a PhD at the ETH in Zurich and uh, spent some time as a postdoc at the MIT in Boston. And uh, you are now managing uh, quite some data science-driven solutions at weather.com. So looking forward at your takes on data acquisition. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. So let me 
Okay, so the screen is shared and now, um, yeah, let let me talk about weather data and um, how to add weather data in, in your normal machine learning models. So because usually um, putting the data inside a model is only one step, but creating or pre-processing the data in a way is, um, let's say, some card, uh, some, some art of science. So, um, so let me um, give you some introduction about um, Vetter.com and Meteonomics. So um, at Vetter.com, we have a B2B brand, which is called Meteonomics. And there we are consulting um, many B2B um, companies um, with weather solutions. So there we support them to make the most out of the weather data. So, and um, let me let me just show you some some general overview. So, usually, when you look at weather, you think, oh, weather, yeah, based on weather, you are doing some changes in your behavior. And usually, the most prominent um, change in the behavior is 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 the traveling. So, uh, but you can find also a lot of different um, other industries where weather and the short-term weather plays a lot of um, a, a huge role. So especially in energy production, when you are forecasting um, what your your um, wind um, power plant um, produces during the next days, or for example, in insurance. So when you have a heavy storm, so how much um, yeah ins insurance cases do you expect? So and from this um, you need the the weather and um how how should you use the weather and um this this i will i, I will guide you and give you some uh, best practice from uh, my experience so we are just going to, to to the most easy forecast and the most easy forecast is always um forecasting so forecasting in general is is pretty easy so what you usually want to do is you have some kind of KPI, a target KPI, um, and you want to know in advance how this target KPI would look like. Here, this is an example of, of a product um, which is um, which is sold in Germany over a couple of years. And um, now what you are usually doing is um, to get this information and to, and to get a good forecasting. Um, you put some KPIs in this, you put um, KPIs like the sales in the in the history, but you can also put some marketing um, events there or you are putting the point of sales there. And what we also propose and um, what we can also see is when you put weather there, you would improve your forecast. And now the question is, why do you improve your forecast with weather? So usually weather is is uncorrelated to many many other um, other parameters you put into your forecast um, engine. So usually KPIs, the sales in the in the histories are correlated but not correlated with the weather on the next day. So and this gives you a boost in your information, and with this information um, the model improves. So, and th the first thing is um, when you look at this, the entire data science um, um, process. So there you put, you make your training in the past and you want to predict the, the future. And therefore it's very important to have consistent data. So what does consistent data mean? So um, for example, take, take the wind example. So when you have a forecast of wind for the next day in meters per hour uh, or meters per second, and in the history, you have kilometers per hour. So then you have the same data, but it's different, um, different units. And when you make a training on a different units, of course, in the future, your correct data will lead to very wrong results and especially in weather this is uh, this is a huge issue because uh, forecasting and um, historical data has a lot of 
differences. So starting from um, when you look at the, at, the, at the maximum temperature level, for example, um, the maximum temperature in the future is should be the maximum temperature um, at one um, time of the day. So, but in most historical data sets, the, the maximum temperature is not the highest measured temperature, but the temperature over a certain time. So, and therefore it's always important to have the data consistent. So the, the next thing is what, what we have um, always seen is averaging the weather is um, not the best idea. So here I just take um, this, a stock market example. So here you have the German stock index over the last four weeks and um, the stock index changes on the daily level and over the entire period you have a two percentage growth. So and now you can see okay the stock market has two percentage um, uplift and the effect of, of the changes over the last um, months were two percent however when you dig deep on the daily level there then you can um, make the long or the short call um, uh, transactions and um, when you go on the daily level and would have make a better um, or or calculate the, the effect based on on these you can see that that you have roughly ten percent and then um, if you would invest in the stock market, so you would uh, change um, more or less on daily level and the best performance would be in this entire period, 70%. And this is pretty similar to the weather. So the weather itself um, is more or less when you take the weather over in, in an entire year. So the weather effects from year to year is pretty slow. In most cases so here this is an example um, for also a, a product so and then you have changes from year to year um, of two percent however the average weather effect on the days are ten percent and um, and when you look into special days with special thunderstorms or heavy rain then you get even higher weather effects so here you should um, learn that you should avoid averaging the weather data. So then one thing is, is always um, the seasonality. So usually when you hear, hear about weather, then you are saying, okay, weather and seasonality, there's an interconnection. And of course, um, there's an interconnection. However, um, weather defines usually the seasonality. Um, on the bottom, you see again this, the, same, um, the same data as um, three slides before. And um, here I zoomed in in, in a special in special months. So and here you can see that from the daily to um, from one year to another year, the weather can and the weather effect can be significantly different. In one year here in May, the weather boosts the sales of this product, and the other year it decreases the sales. So um, when you heard okay, instead of weather, I can use seasonality. This is not 100% uh, the case. So if you want to have more details and you get, and you want to get better results, take, um, take always the weather instead of a seasonality factor. So, and um, there's also one thing about weather. Um, weather is, is huge and huge in the sense you have many different um, possibilities to use weather. So, and um, here I just uh, make one example uh, with temperature. So um, you can think of many different questions about your temperature and how you can add this to your model. So, and only with this small uh, or with this um, sample, um, you can make over 100,000 different um, different features if you combine all of them. So, and all of them are somehow important. So for example, in the summer, the temperature um, has a different impact than in winter. Or um, taking daily data instead of hourly data. So, and then at some point, when you start building your legs for your models, um, you have so many features, um, 
usually you are in the overfitting region. So therefore it's it's very important um, to have a very nice and good feature selection for your weather data. So as as the last slide, I just want to give you an overview about um, about some use cases where where you have two different dimensions. So one dimension is the weather dimension and the other one is, is the climate dimension. We heard a lot about this. And um, the, the weather is more, let's say, um, on short term. So if you want to make a forecast on short term, so the day-to-day -day forecast, it's very important to have the weather features. When you are going to climate and using climate data, um, these are other use cases. So one one example is here for traveling. So traveling, so you can have um, long planned holidays. So and long planned holidays are, are of course um, not really um, impacted by the weather. So you are booking your holidays um, in advance a couple of months before. So, but you are of course booking your holidays, um, for example, ski holidays, um, not in south of Spain in the summer, but maybe in Austria in the winter. So on the other hand, um, if you want to make a short trip and traveling, so this you are deciding um, more or less right now. And um, there you look at the weather forecast. Is the weather in the region I'm going um, good or not? But for my purpose, of course, this is, can be also something different. Um, but th this is um, th this is totally different. So both are traveling, and both are in in different regions of of this graph. So it's it's really important um, to to choose the appropriate use case um, for your weather forecasting. So if you are using weather with a use case. Um, where the weather do not play a role, of course, nothing um, will come out. And um, and yeah, with this, I'm I'm just closing my my presentation, and I'm happy to to answer your questions afterwards. Thanks. Thank you as well. Uh, great uh, summary slide. Um, yeah, uh, I remind the audience that we will have a Q and A round. Uh, uh, after all the speakers uh, had their chance to contribute. Uh, so thanks a lot, uh, Christian, again for that. Now, um, I'd like to turn to our final speaker for that expert round, uh, Gerhard Rolczek. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Gerhard, Hi, to the screen. Um, to introduce you, uh, you are uh, a PhD in uh, computational linguistics. You studied in uh, Munich and um, uh, you are working with uh, GLANOS uh, that uh, you will definitely present us uh, within within the following um, within the following minutes. So thank you very much. The floor is yours. Looking forward uh, to your presentation. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, present a little bit of what we are doing in the area of ESG text mining. I uh, hope you can all see my my screen uh, and that nice blue <laughs> uh, sphere. Uh, that reminds of uh, or sets the overall tone uh, for sustainability. Uh, what I'm trying to show is how we are using uh, our proprietary tech stack and uh, open uh, source tools, but also publicly available data to um, distill sustainability signals from Newswire. Um, so um, first things first, um, uh, what's this cowboy guy? doing. Um, of course, that should uh, a little bit um, create a nice atmosphere because you might remember uh, those advertisements from the 80s um, uh, where it was totally normal to have cinema ads for smoking. Uh, and the, the interesting uh, thing why I brought this up is um, if you look at ESG scores, and of course, there are um, sort of famous um, entities and agencies that provide scores and then there are smaller ones. Wait a uh, second, but, yeah, just a yeah. second. I, I think you're referring to the Marlboro guy here. We still see uh, ESG in the news. At least that's true for me. Ah, that's too bad because it, it worked uh, just a minute ago. Um, let's see. Let me just share once again. Mm -hmm. Sorry for that.
Okay, I think I think you're seeing the Marlboro guy now. Okay, so um, okay, great. Um, uh, if you look, look, look at ESG scores, uh, sometimes we get very surprising results. Uh, we have uh, mining companies that get basically an A++, uh, or we get tobacco companies that get an A++. And as uh, Mr. Kerr, uh, with his LinkedIn profile on the right-hand side, uh, justly um, said, the ratings can inadvertently attribute strong sustainability credentials to companies whose products may be fundamentally unsustainable, like MCI, uh, which is probably the primary uh, rating agency for ESG at the moment, and, and uh, which ratings are behind uh, many ESG um, products, such as ETFs uh, that are based on ESG. So we, we get uh, A ratings for tobacco companies. And why is that the case? Because uh, those scorings are fundamentally intransparent. Uh, they're often self-reported and, and often, um, you know, they, they sort of uh, are counterintuitive. Um, you know, those, those companies do, do not perform any, any fraud. They play strictly by the rules, but the rules that themselves are not per perhaps um, really helpful to determine sustainable companies uh, because it's a, it's a very limited view. So um, what we are trying to do is, um, I'm gonna just a sec. okay, I think now, now I just move, moved on to the next slide. Um, we're trying to create um, a picture such as in this map. Uh, uh, this shows uh, carbon emission based on clusters where we have the US, and we have China, we have India, and of course the Europe cluster. We try to create such a picture uh, from different news uh, articles. Uh, so when we find, uh, in this case, here are positive news articles, um, like um, in India, uh, Prime Minister Modi is, is leading world and sustainable development and clean energy uh, that contributed uh, to a positive sentiment, in this case with a geographical scope, uh, India, uh, or it can have a, a company scope. Here we have uh, NLC India Coal uh, to invest in 3000 megawatt solar power projects. So we know this is an investment into alternative energy. We know where it's happening. We know the extent, uh, and we can contribute this to a specific company. And th uh, this gives us another layer of signals that along with um, annual sustainability reports and analyst findings can help to sort of balance the picture a little bit more so that we have less Marlboro men uh, and more really sustainable companies in our uh, ESG powered uh, funds. Uh, here are just a sh shorter uh, overview. Uh, those are the sort of top level categories uh, that we're monitoring. So we have cl climate change, we've got natural resources, pollution waste, but we also uh, cover the other letters in our uh, famous three letter word. So we cover the social aspects, we cover the governance aspects, uh, and we're also um, e extracting facets along with, with these um, categories. So a thing like uh, a grow in um, alternative energy, or uh, we can discern whether it's a planned um, building of a solar power plant, or it's something that has already uh, been, been done. Um, how do, do we do this and, and uh, what uh, linguistic and machine learning tools uh, do we need for this? So um, I, I was using one of those um, sample sentences um, that was just uh, shown in our tool. So BMW uh, plans to build 360,000 electric vehicle charging sites in China this year. So again, if you remember this map, this is a good sentence for our use case. We have a company, we have a um, geographic scope, we know what's happening in China, we have some quantification, uh, and we know uh, the area is, in this case, uh, electric mobility. And of course, it's a positive signal, uh, and it comes as a planning facet. So it's not something that is already done, but you know, hopefully it 
will be done in, in the future. But if I run this uh, through a standard dependency parser, in this case, I used a Stanford dependency parser available on core nlp.run, uh, I don't get the structure that I really need. Uh, there's quite a, a large gap between this and uh, what we really need. Something like we got a company, we got a pre predicate. In this case, it's building um, with a facet it plans to build. Uh, we get you know, some sort of numeric or uh, quantifying expression. We got a product that we know comes from the electronic mobility uh, space. We got a location and a time. And in order to achieve this sort of representation, which is you know, what we at least try to do, I'm not, not saying that it works 100% of the time, but uh, uh, we're getting um, better over time. Uh, we need a robust named entity recognition. We need, need to know that BMW uh, AG, is a, uh, AG is a company, and uh, ideally that it's also the same as BMW. W without the legal suffix. Um, we need to uh, recognize product as, as named entities, which is very difficult um, uh, and a big challenge, I think, for, for everyone in this field. Um, we need to uh, re recognize predicates, and in this case, uh, building, which could, of course, um, also appear as noun predicates something uh, plans um, the construction of 360,000 electric vehicle charging. So it doesn't really uh, depend on, uh, please show me the verb in this sentence, but uh, what we really need to know is show me the semantic head. What's, what's really the activity that, that's uh, going on in this sentence? And why do we need all of that? Well, uh, we need to make, make sure that we understand uh, sentence such as plans to build versus does not plan to build or has abandoned its plans to, to, to build or passive voices or negation, all, all these things that uh, make language complicated and very exciting to, to analyze. Um, we're also using techniques from few-shot learning. Uh, what we're doing here is we have a support set uh, a small set of uh, manually annotated sample sentences. Unfortunately, there's there's yet no uh, golden set for for ESG uh, annotations. Hopefully, there will be one in in, in the future. Uh, but we annotated uh, sentences with here's a positive signal for the electromobility area. Uh, we uh, created a similarity function that takes into account our structural information. Also embeddings that tell us what build is very similar to construct something like a virtue to back or, or glove uh, that can tell us which words are very similar. And we also um, know from our own company universe that uh, BMW is a car manufacturer. And in that sense, it's very similar to, to Toyota or similar to Audi, uh, but not similar to uh, Marlboro, for instance. And, and then we can query uh, new sentences against our support set. Uh, we can find here sentences that have a very high uh, or a surprisingly low, low score. Of course, we're using some heuristics uh, that uh, tell us probably this sentence is about ESG because we have a keyword list, our, our ESG taxonomy. And then we add um, still manually or um, with a manual check to our existing ESG taxonomy. Um, and what we can do with that is something like I guess, uh, show um, in, in this slide, that's, that's from our current um, product. We can see that um, BMW has co collaborated with Toyota for developing fuel cells. Well, that's a positive signal for the alternative energy research subcategory, which is part of the energy category. Or uh, we can see uh, a, a new snippet such as BMW. W won't have a new dedicated electric vehicle platform until 2025. Well, here you can see how the predicate argument structure tells us it's a negation. They won't have it, so it's uh, accounted for as a negative um, signal. And that's how we can uh, aggregate um, those different signals on a company level, but also on a geographic level or on a um, industry level. And we can uh, create some trends. But uh, that's not all. So uh, again, uh, reminding you of the nice 80s with a um, screenshot with a still from a, a 
nice movie that also has <laughs> very interesting ideas about AI and, and how machines can can learn to um, yeah. how to start or not start a thermonuclear war. That's that's from the movie War Games. So uh, what we're trying to do is trying to learn uh, on all those different uh, signals that we're extracting. Uh, and, and one interesting uh, signal that we're that we yet have to acquire is uh, sustainability reports. Many large uh, corporate websites publish sustainability reports, but I'm just uh, wanted to show you how difficult it is to compare those different sustainability uh, reports. So we got Eon and we got Buttonfall. Of course, they're very similar, both energy producers. But if you look uh, closely at these slides, one comes in the form of an Excel. Uh, Buttonfall provides it with their system sustainability data in the form of an Excel. Uh, EON has a very large sustainability report, you know, lots of text uh, and, and a few tables. But the challenge is how can we compare those two things? They should talk about similar things. They're both energy producers. So they should talk about how much coal they're using, uh, how much nuclear energy they're using. And it's somewhere, it's, it's, it's hidden in there. Uh, but it would take at least another 10 minutes, if, if not much, much longer, um, to, to uh, even for a human to, to understand how to compare these tables. And it's, of course, um, much more challenging to do this on a large scale and for many sustainability reports. So that, that's as an outlook. That's what we're uh, trying to uh, achieve, uh, taking in more signals, not only the news war, but also sustainability reports, existing ESG scores, to get a more uh, comprehensive picture, make sure that um, if we monitor uh, companies for ESG activity that they're fairly accredited for, um, that uh, their true ambitions in sustainability are scored high and uh, any form of greenwashing is, is hopefully scored scored low. Um, well, uh, we're, we're doing uh, natural language processing in business, but I think we can skip that. Um, and yeah, thanks. Um, I'm happy to, to answer uh, questions. Um, afterwards. Thank you, Gerhard, very thanks. And uh, afterwards is now, basically. Um, uh, we are having reached the end of this Experts Round uh, input session, so I uh, would welcome the, the audience to um, ask any sorts of questions. Now you have the experts here, uh, one, once in a lifetime experience, who can now ask all the questions you, you'd like to ask. Yes, please post your questions on the chat. We will uh, then pick them up and uh, post them in here as well. Yeah. And um, by the way, the speakers are also allowed to ask questions to the other speakers, of course. Of course. So it's not mm -hmm. only in, in, in one direction. So yeah, feel free. Yeah. So I have a question. So um, in the first presentation, there was a use case. Um, we are we are finding or, or a region is coming to you. And this region say, okay, I want to change my um, my corn growth there. So, um, have you also thought about the other way around, so that you identify regions where they grow something and they shouldn't grow there something? Because this, I think, this is a huge opportunity because then um, you can pinpoint this and you can say, okay, in this region you shouldn't um, um, grow, for example, corn there. So just do something else, you have a higher return on investment. Absolutely. I mean, uh, th it goes both ways. And um, I mean, what we are trying to do through this model is to identify crops that would naturally grow in a certain environment. And it goes, goes both ways. Um, and um, to, to minimize the use of inputs, basically, so that, you know, you can, um, you don't have to kind of apply more chemicals or more fertilizers, pesticides, or, um, even, um, you know, more irrigation. So there are large areas of the world which are currently very rough or sugarcane. And we know rice and sugarcane are very water demanding crops. So, and one of the greatest scarcity that we face around the world today is this water scarcity. And so shifting to some other crops would be better in this case, rather than just uh, um, de you know, depending on these crops. But, um, so these are also traditional ways of farming that we have to change and propose new alternatives that could give them a better um, investment on returns, um, return on investment, sorry. And also the other thing that really um, keeps agriculture in chains is also the system of subsidies. So people who are doing, let's say, uh, sugarcane, the farmers are highly subsidized. 
So as a result of that, they have no incentive sometimes to switch to some other crops that would be more beneficial for the environment or even, um, you know, it's not always a free market economy. Let's put it like this in agriculture, which is really hampering the adoption. But definitely, this is what we are trying to do and uh, see how we can uh, move forward. There's also the, the resilience to climate change. In some regions, in some regions the, the weather is changing very rapidly, um, especially in the past 10 years. And to get farmers to grow what they used to grow because they don't want to live any better. And I think uh, with uh, the advantage of, of, uh, of models like ours that is using uh, climate data, we can also go for climate forecast and, and, and look where this particular crop will go in 10 years. And, and, and that's something that we want to do that will advise also local governments, uh, especially uh, go back to that point where they, they rule, uh, so the basic they in, in India, for instance, they deploy the years how much of uh, I don't know, onions they have to grow in this the region. And we can advise them on actually what is possible at a certain uh, uh, level of sustainability. Thank you very much. Uh, and still, uh, the relevant to the topic is really uh, data access. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So, to, uh, okay, to uh, I, sorry. Go ahead. No, you you wanted to finish uh, up and tell more. No, I'm sure I went, I went to uh, because I, I worked already with Gerard, but I think I think one of the difficulties that we have in agriculture related to text is like there's a tons of wealth of information yes. that is. In, uh, historical archival uh, uh, literature, essentially. And that's, that's where the bulk of all those old crops that were grown 10 years, 15, 20 years ago, uh, and the information still lies there. And that's definitely something that uh, uh, globally we should explore, that as it leverages that gold mine for agriculture in the future. It's part of the things that the uh, uh, future is doing as well, just trying to revise. Yes, and a lot of crops that are lost or forgotten, and it's in the old literature. These are like uh, typed literature, then made into a PDF, or in some cases even handwritten. And it's, uh, the information is there, but how do you get this information out? This is the biggest challenge we face. Mm -hmm. uh, I have one question. Um, because uh, Most of you are using open data or public data, um, especially for the text mining for the ESG. So, and, and from my experience from other industries, often open and public data, the data quality is often an issue because no one feels responsible. No one takes the stewardship for the data. They often it's just published and say, okay, now you got the data and do whatever you want to do with it. Uh, what's your opinion on this? Is private data, is it has a better data quality or is it the open data has a better data quality or it really depends on the the data source, the data set? Maybe, um, Agat, uh, yeah. what's uh, your experiences? Well, I would say that there are certainly uh, there are some differences. There are specific uh, data pools. You know, when you think of you know, something like ge geographical names, uh, the gazetteers, where it doesn't really make, make sense to turn to any proprietary, um, proprietary data because you've got yeah. um, geo names and you get open street map and, you know, they're pretty good. Um, and if it comes to uh, Newswire, well, there, there is a very interesting because um, there, of course, there are many uh, high quality um, news that's uh, behind uh, paywalls. So you have to subscribe mm. them. And if you go into specific um, domains, you really need uh, paywalled content. Uh, so, so yes, there's a, a definite case for uh, paid content. And I would say even more so uh, for financial data, which of course also plays into ESG. So if you want to uh, get a high quality information on revenues, incomes, distribution of uh, revenues, I think you, you have to go to the um, Nexus Nexus and Thomson Reuters and S&Ps of, of this world. Uh, but one big advantage with, uh, with open data, of course, is that uh, it makes it easier to share it with the world. So you can have a link uh, which takes you directly to a publicly uh, available data point versus uh, with a pay data, well, we basically have to trust it. Uh, it's um, sometimes much more difficult to convince uh, someone that it's really true information if you cannot see it for him or herself. Yeah. So now there's one question um, on the chat by the participant Anders. 
Um, as a follow-up to the last question, or the question before, uh, are you also considering whether certain crops are naturally occurring in the region you are studying to factor in impacts of what could be considered invasive species to not negatively impact, uh, for example, biodiversity? Well, if I may, um, we, we are at the moment, the crops we are focusing on, these are crops of commercial importance. So let's say we, we looked at cacao, we looked at olives, we looked at uh, arnica, we are looking at crops that have some commercial importance. They are not invasive species as such. So these are not like uh, certain grasses or certain plants that would grow without control. And the only thing I see that could be happening in what we are trying to do here is, the, uh, is to make sure that uh, strict phytosanitary measures are uh, considered and taken into account before introducing a species that is um, alien or foreign to a certain region. But um, if, we, if we have these measures in place and if we um, kind of monitor these crops and their evolution carefully, then I think we, um, we should be able to limit the spread, spread of invasive species. But on the other hand, if you're uh, talking about plant species, if you look at also the animals, um, the, the, sorry, insects, so if you see pests and diseases also spreading, at some point um, there will be... Uh, I mean, um, spread of species beyond their geographical uh, habitats and regions uh, due to climate change, due to, uh, you know, global movement, transportation, all other things. The only thing we have to do here is really strictly follow the phytosanitary uh, and, and regulatory measures. Like, other than it's that. a long race. We need to introduce yeah. the plants. We need to run trials. It's not to like, introduce the species and maybe grow. Yes. But what we are also, I would like to show you one, um, maybe if we can, uh, go back to the presentation. Uh, and unfortunately, we are running out of time, or uh, time is already over. But maybe um, uh, Anders, um, uh, just contact them. They uh, shared their um, uh, contact details, or you can um, contact them via Hopin. He's also saying uh, thanks a lot for the elaboration. Thank you. And thank you guys uh, for uh, the three intriguing presentations. It was very interesting to see that. Um, now it's time for another <clears throat> special session, um, uh, and it's about you, it's for the participants. It's uh, speed networking, which was quite fun last year. So I encourage everyone uh, to join us uh, for the next 30 minutes of speed networking. So you will, you will meet random people and have about, I think, five minutes time to discuss everything uh, you uh, wanted to discuss with them. And then there will be a lunch break and we will meet uh, again at uh, 1 p.m. for the next expert round on uh, space data for Earth observation. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.